we have uh, two uh, theory sessions during which I will uh, finish up on query optimization very briefly and then on transactions. And then we have the lab session immediately afterwards uh, after lunch on transactions followed by uh, the last couple of presentations and uh, discussion session, logistics and other stuff. Okay, so yesterday in the lab, we saw uh, examples of query plans and we had a brief discussion on alternative plans and why the optimizer chose a certain plan based on statistics. So this chapter basically describes uh, some of those techniques uh, which we briefly looked at plus a whole bunch of other stuff. And a few people had questions about this yesterday, which I would request them to ask again today while I give the talk, so that um, some of the common uh, questions about query optimization, which uh, people have been asking, can be cleared. So please interrupt me at any time. Okay. So the basic thing in query optimization is that given any SQL query, uh, we have to evaluate it in some way. And there's a bunch of operations which the database supports, primitive operations, which are basically variants of relational algebra, join, selection, projection, and so on, group by. So uh, given an SQL query, there are many different relational algebra queries which would give an exactly equivalent answer. Now given a relational algebra query, there is another issue of how exactly do you evaluate it. Given a join, we saw that there are multiple join algorithms, given a selection, you have multiple options, uh, do a relation scan, use one index, use some other index, and so forth. So there are basically two levels of choices. The first level of choice, which we are going to discuss initially, is at the logical level. So given a relation algebra expression, there's another logical ex expression, which is equivalent. In fact, there are many, many logical expressions which are equivalent. And then we go to the physical level, which is instead of just saying this is a join, we will say that this is a merge join or a hash join. Instead of saying selection, we will say selection using an index and so forth. So then uh, such plans which are annotated with those evaluation algorithms are often referred to as the physical um, relational algebra or the physical plan. So here is a small example where in, uh, we have a join of teachers and course, then joined with instructor, and then there's a selection on department equal to music. Note that this query actually finds all uh, names and of instructors and titles of courses they teach, provided both the instructor and the course are from the music department. Why? Because department name comes from instructor and from course, and the natural join makes sure that both are from the same department, and then this uh, selection restricts it to music. So that's the meaning of this query. Now, uh, another uh, equivalent query to this is on the right hand side. So first we select instructors in the music department and then we join it with teachers join with course. Can you suggest uh, another equivalent query for this? Basically the order in which you do joins is not really material. They all give the same result. So we could have join instructor with teachers and then join that result with course. What about instructor with course? Could we have joined it? We can do a cross product. It would still be correct. A natural join of instructor, uh, sorry, it's not a cross product. There is a department name in common, beg your pardon. So even that is okay. But even if it were a cross product, it is still a valid relation algebra expression, except you would probably not do it because it would be very inefficient. Okay. So uh, in, in this particular query, there are many choices of join order. There are many choices of where to place the selection. Uh, the projection in this case has to be at the top, but in some cases, uh, even here, in fact, you can remove unnecessary attributes early. So for example, in this one, for instructor, are there any unnecessary attributes? which we can project out right at the beginning. Instructor has a salary which is not projected out. It doesn't participate in any join, so you can throw it out. Instructor has uh, ID, but we can't throw it out. Instructor has name, we can't throw it out because it's used in. ID is used in the joins. And department name is used, so the rest cannot be eliminated. In teachers, 
there is in fact a lot of stuff which can be eliminated. It has a section ID, um, it has a semester, year, um, the time slot, uh, no sorry time slot is for the section relation. Here there are three things which can be projected. So basically there is in fact a lot of stuff you can do to remove unnecessary attributes. We can do selections early, this, the second version selects on department name equal to music early so that you do not unnecessarily carry around instructors of other departments and do joins only to throw them away at the end. So we can actually come up with a plan which we would think is a lot cheaper. But how do we know it is cheaper? Well, that is based on uh, statistics, estimates based on statistics which the query optimizer uh, uses to choose amongst alternative plans as we discussed yesterday. Okay, so this is an example of an evaluation plan um, for the same one. Uh, what have we done here? Mm, we have um, actually this uh, this one is actually not consistent with the previous one. I think one of the um, plans didn't get updated um, in the slides. So what is uh, this doing here? It's actually projecting course on course ID title, and then um, pipelining the result of the projection to a hash join. The hash join will partition it, it also partitions teachers and then the result of that join is passed up to sort. Now as we discussed yesterday, many uh, algorithms require a sort. In particular here we are doing a sort because we are doing a merge join up here. So um, it is, we have to sort this result. Now the result of the hash join can be passed up to sort, the sort runs um, and then the result of the sort can be passed up to merge. Now it says pipeline, how can you pipeline the result of a sort? Well that is actually because the sort operator can be broken into two parts. One is the run generation and the other is the merge. The merge result can be pipelined instead of being written out. The run generation actually writes runs to uh, disk and then the merge step reads them back from disk and its result can be pipelined up. Similarly on this side we say a select department name is music using a particular index which presumably is on department name. And then uh, we sort it because merge joins uh, needs a sort and we are pipelining this into sort. Similarly the output of sort is pipelined into merge join which in fact pipelines it into project. Now can we, um, we are joining here on ID but that ID is being removed by the project. So how do we eliminate duplicates? It is sorted on ID which is actually useless for removing duplicates on name comma title because many different IDs may have the same name and title. Uh, the title is for the course, name is for the instructor. So we actually have to sort on name comma title to remove duplicates or we could hash but this particular project is annotated by saying do it using sort. So this is a complete evaluation plan, real evaluation plans as we saw yesterday in PostgreSQL actually have even more details uh, than this. Um, so we will uh, leave this over there. Uh, how do you view evaluation plans? We already saw how to do it in PostgreSQL using explain, uh, others have uh, equivalent ways. In SQL Server has set show plan text on and off, Oracle uh, has um, uh, some version of explain. There is little bit more work you have to do to get the result and DB2 has its own. So every optimizer lets you see the plans. Okay. Now uh, how do you uh, generate the space of equivalent expressions? We, we saw an expression, we saw another expression, then we discussed a few more which are all equivalent and some of them may be more efficient than the others. So how do you systematically generate the alternative plans and then pick the cheapest? and do this as efficiently as possible without wasting time. That is the key requirement. Now there are actually um, two answers to this question and different systems have used either one of those answers. The first answer is to use equivalence rules and then have a system which can uh, take as input a set of equivalence rules in some appropriate form and uh, the runtime input to that is the query. It uses the equivalence rules, rewrites the query and by means of finding alternatives using equivalence rules, it picks the cheapest one. 
And this is used in SQL Server and Sybase. The other alternative is to uh, not use equivalence rules. So, this is actually a fairly complex. It was a later addition. Uh, initially, people did not know how to do this efficiently. So, although people knew equivalence rules are important, how to use it practically was not clear earlier on. And it was only in the mid 90s that uh, there was a project called Volcano, which actually showed how to do this reasonably efficiently. And then it was improved upon subsequently. Uh, so, the other alternative which dates back to 1979, uh, when there is a paper on access path selection is based on optimizing the join order, because the join order is the most important part of query optimization. There are other issues too, when do you do selections? So, that can be handled heuristically. The idea is that why ever postpone a selection, do it as soon as you can. Okay. So, based on that heuristic, which is which generally works with some small tweaks. Um, th that is basically what the original system R optimizer implemented and subsequently pretty much all the databases uh, like Oracle, DB2, uh, PostgreSQL, everybody implements that algorithm. So, we will briefly look at both these alternatives. However, what we won't do is how to uh, show, discuss how to implement uh, query optimization using equivalence rules. We look at the equivalence rules, but how to use the equivalence rules in an optimizer is something which is more complex than we have time for here. We are going to skip that. So, let us start by looking at the rules. At least logically it is important to know what is going on. Uh, what do we mean by equivalence rules? So, two relational algebra expressions are said to be equivalent if they always generate the same set of results or in fact on in SQL they should generate the same multi set of results. What is this multi set? SQL allows duplicates. So, when you run a join operation on duplicates, it in turn generates duplicates. So, the uh, count of duplicates is defined in the SQL language. So, if the input has so many duplicates, output should have so many duplicates. That is defined in the SQL language basically for each operation, for join, for select, for uh, project and so forth, union. So, if we have two uh, alternative expressions for SQL query evaluation, they better generate the same number of duplicates, otherwise the results will differ depending on which one you choose, which is not acceptable. So, we really want multi set equivalence in the case of SQL. And an equivalence rule says that two expressions of the same form are equivalent. So, let us look at, uh, I am going to just go straight to the pictorial uh, depiction of a few rules and then I will come back to this. So, the first rule pictorially here says that if I have a join with some join condition theta, joins like this are referred to as theta joins, joins with a the condition. Then the first rule says that if I do a join with E1 as the left input and E2 as the right input, it is certainly equivalent to flipping the order E2 as the left and E1 as the right. That is fairly clear. The second rule is a rule for natural join, which says if I join E1, E2 first and then join with E3, that result is equivalent to joining E1 with the result of joining E2, E3. That is here. What is this rule called? It is called associativity. You are familiar with this from uh, algebra in high school. So, that is associativity. The first one is commutativity. Now, I showed this for theta join and this for natural join, but uh, the uh, rule 6b is the same thing for associativity for theta joins and there is a similar rule for uh, commutativity for natural join. Now, here is an example of another kind of rule, uh, which says if I have a selection on top of a join and under the condition that the selection only involves attributes from one of the relations, I can do the selection before the join. In, in other words, I have pushed the selection through the join and apply it directly on E1 before the join. Now, this is also uh, should be reasonably clear. If the selection involves conditions from E2 and E1, I cannot do this because I, those attributes are going to be available only uh, after the join. On the other hand, if the selection is a conjunction, if the selection is of the form uh, E1 dot A equal to 5 and E2 dot B equal to 5 or something as E2 dot B equal to 6, it is an and. Then what do I do? I can actually push one part into the left end, one part into the right. 
Um, so, there is also equivalence rules for that. Let us um, very briefly look at uh, some of the equivalence rules. Uh, this time it is not pictorial, it is uh, algebraic representation. So, this one says sigma theta 1 and theta 2 on E is the same as doing 1 first, I mean actually theta 2 first and then doing theta 1. And the next one says that the result of doing theta 2 first then theta 1 is the same as doing theta 1 first and then theta 2. So, now if you do this, you will find that you can actually, um, you can apply it here, if theta is theta 1 and theta 2, you can break it into 2, then push 1 down and then the other selection will be on top, then you may be able to push the other one down. Okay. So, you can use multiple rules to get what you want. Uh, then there are a few more using projections and uh, selections, which we um, pushing selections uh, into cross products, that is a select on a cross product is really a theta join. And in SQL, the from clause is actually a cross product and the where clause is a selection and that cross product is turned into joins and this is the basic rule for that. Okay, I am going to not go into every one of these rules uh, for lack of time, but there are uh, several more rules in the book and there are many more rules which are not in the book, uh, including a few which are in the exercises and others which are not even there, but are actually used. Uh, the SQL Server Optimizer I think uses um, some very large number, I think a uh, couple of hundred rules overall. Now, the problem is the more rules you have, the more alternative plans you generate and the more time it takes. So, actually uh, what SQL Server and other such optimizers do is they will not use all the rules at the beginning. They will start with a few rules and use those to optimize a query. And if they get a good plan, a very efficient plan using those, they won't try the other rules. But if the plan is still very expensive, then they will try other rules in the hope that maybe one of the other rules can reduce the cost more. Okay, so uh, we are not going to uh, discuss all those rules here. Uh, this slide uh, shows that you can have multiple um, rules applied to the same expression uh, to get a more efficient thing and we have seen this already. So, I am going to skip this. So, now let us come to the, we have seen the equivalence rules, we are going to leave equivalence rules at that point and focus on the join ordering problem. So, if I have a join uh, which is given like this, R1 join R2 join with R3, with associativity we know we can do it differently. Now, why would these two have a cost difference? That is basically because the sizes of the relations may differ and the selectivity of a join, that is when I join R1, R2, what is the size of the output? That may differ for R1, R2 and for R2, R3 or for that matter R1, R3. So, supposing R1 is, um, maybe R1 is small, therefore R1 join R2 is also small, but R2 join R3 is large. So, if we use the right hand side here, we are going to spend a lot of time generating R2 join R3 and then join it with R1 which basically eliminates most of the tuples and gets a small result perhaps. In which case, maybe R1 join R2 would have a very small result if R1 is small and there is a foreign key, uh, the join is on a foreign key perhaps and then that can be joined with R3 and all the intermediate results are small. And then the join may be much cheaper as a result. There are also other reasons why joins may be expensive or cheap because of indices and so forth. But the join order is really key to this. Um, there is an example here of why a relation may be small, which is a, our earlier example, uh, which had a selection and department name is music. So, if music has only a few instructors and there are many departments, um, department name equal to music on instructor could be very small, whereas teachers could be very large and course could be very large. So, teachers join course would also be large, it is a foreign key join, but it will be as large as teachers and then most of those are eliminated by the subsequent join. So, it makes sense to first uh, do the selection on instructor, join that with teachers and then join that with course. Okay. So, I will uh, leave uh, the equivalence rules back there and see how we can get these join orders. The goal is to find the best join order. Unfortunately, there are many, many join orders. 
how many join orders are there? Well, uh, if you take arbitrary join trees, what is the join tree? It is a binary tree with n leaves, where n is the number of relations which are being joined. Now, the question is how many such trees are there and that answer is basically the Catalan number on n minus 1, uh, would not get into the derivation, uh, but it is quite large. For n equal to 7, it is already 6 uh, lakhs, for n equal to 10, it is 176 billion. So, you really, really do not want to evaluate all possible joint trees. So, what do you do? It turns out dynamic programming comes to the rescue and turns a ridiculously large number into a large but more manageable number, which is exponential. It is 3 power n or 2 to the power n depending on what class of trees we consider. And the dynamic programming algorithm um, can actually be understood as follows. To find the best joint tree for a set of n relations, we can um, recursively find the best plans for every combination of S1 join with S minus S1. So, we want to find the join of S which has n relations. We will take every uh, set S1 which is a non empty strict subset. So, S minus S1 is also non empty. So, we will take every possible combination, find the best plan for S1, find the best plan for S minus S1 and then find the best way of joining these two results. Now, if you, we have many alternatives, every set S1 is an alternative. So, if we find the minimum across all sets S1, we would have found the best way of joining the set S. Because you think about it, to get a join of uh, some n relations, there has to be a final join. That final join has to join two uh, sub results. What we are saying is, let us look at all possible final joins. And for each possible final join, we are recursively finding the best plan for each input. And then amongst all possible final joints, we are picking the cheapest. Now, this is a recursive thing. So, the recursion has to have a base case, otherwise we have a problem. So, the base case is when your input S1 or S minus S1 is a single relation, in which case we are going to heuristically apply all the selections which are there on that relation and pick the uh, best way of in enforcing that selection. That is the base case. Now, if you use this recursive algorithm, you know, just by a simple recursive algorithm, the problem is that we will repeatedly uh, call the recursive procedure for a particular subset. For each subset, we will call it many, many times. And the next intuition for dynamic programming is to realize that if we evaluated the best plan for a particular subset once, we just store it. Next time you somebody else asks for the same thing. Why would somebody else ask for the best plan for the same subset? Because a particular subset may be joined with many different relations or many different subsets. So, there will be many recursive calls to find the best plan on a given subset. And the first time it is called, we compute it using the recursive procedure and save it. The next time it is called, we look it up and return it. This has uh, two names in the literature. One way to look at it is it is dynamic programming. Um, most of you who have uh, taught an algorithm course or attended an algorithm course at some point or read a book will be familiar with a version of dynamic programming which is bottom up. It, that version computes things before they are needed and then uses them when they are needed. This is actually entirely equivalent except it is expressed top down. It invokes something computes it the first time it is needed, saves it and then on further times when it is needed, it simply looks it up and returns it. It is entirely equivalent. Okay. So, that is dynamic programming and uh, this is a recursive algorithm for join order optimization. I am going to skip this uh, details for lack of time, um, but uh, note that uh, it uh, takes n times 3 power n if we consider um, all possible joint trees, which is n times 3 power n is large, but it is much, much smaller than the Catalan number we saw before. So, for example, for n equal to 10, what do we get? 10 times 3 to the power of 10. Uh, what is uh, 3 to the power of 10? Uh, I do not remember the exact number. We can calculate it, but it is large, but it is not as large as 176 billion, but still it is large. Therefore, 
uh, many optimizers do not consider the space of all possible joint trees, but they restrict it to what are called left deep joint trees. What is the left deep joint tree? It is one where for every join in the joint tree, the one of the, the right input is a relation. Okay. So, it will look like this. In contrast, this is not a left deep joint tree because for this join the right input is a join result. Now, if you only consider left deep joint trees like this, we can in fact modify the uh, previous algorithm a little bit. Uh, there are some details in the slides on how to do it. It is actually very straightforward, but the cost comes down quite sharply. From n times 3 power n, it becomes basically 2 power n. And what is uh, 2 power 10? It is not bad at all. You know, if we do 1000 operations and we can find the best plan for 10 way join, that is pretty good. Now, again any algorithms person will say, but this is exponential. We really do not want exponential algorithms. And it is true that if you have a join which has 30 results, 2 power 30 is very large. Okay, that is going to take a lot of time, it is a billion. We do not want to uh, spend that much time or, or, or space for that matter. So, pretty much every query optimizer has some heuristics built in. If the number of relations gets excessively large, you know up to uh, 15, 16 relations, they will use uh, this algorithm which we just described, which takes 2 power n time. But if it gets even larger, they use heuristics to which will take less time and uh, cut down the time taken so that you do not take 2 power 30 time for example. So, we would not get into the details, but all optimizers have this so that you cannot mess them up by giving a large join query and then get them into trouble. Yeah. Are there ways that that large number of relations really? Yeah, that is a very good question. <laughs> Do you ever have such large relations? And the answer is it is no, typically you do not, which is why um, almost always. So, if you look at our schemas, the toy schemas we have do not even have that many relations, but you can keep joining a relation with itself. For example, like we saw in the station, uh, the track case, we could keep joining. Um, so, the uh, first answer is uh, realistically, these are very, very rare. Hardly ever does anybody ask a query with more than 6, 7 joints. If you have views, this may go up, the views get expanded and it may go up to uh, maybe uh, 10, 15 joints. These do exist in the real world, uh, but 30, they are rare. Well, they can happen. People do write humongous SQL queries in, in the industry. There are horribly complex queries in some uh, many cases. So, what the you, you do not want is that the database dies if you ask such a query. So, the database has to protect itself from such queries. So, they are very rare, but occasionally they do arise. And then you may have an evil person who takes pleasure in showing that the database dies by creating a very large join, meaningless join query, which is very large. Okay. Um, so, this uh, slide talks of uh, the space and time complexity of optimization for join order, and it also talks of how to handle uh, left deep join trees. Okay. Oh, but sorry, I, I said the time complexity is 2 power n, it is actually n times 2 power n, which is still not too bad. 10 times 2 power 10 is still 10,000. It is not 1000, but it is pretty small. Okay. Now, there are some more details uh, to do with interesting sort orders. For lack of time, I am going to skip it here, uh, but I will just briefly mention what it is. Uh, the previous slide assumed that if I am given a set of relations, I want the best plan for it. The thing is that different plans may give different sort orders on the relation. And if the relation is unsorted, if I want to do a join, I may have to then do a sort to do a merge join or I may have to do a hash join. On the other hand, if some uh, join operation below happened to use merge join, it is possible that the result was sorted on a join attribute, which means I can use merge join directly without a sort. So, the bottom line is that previous algorithm is not quite right because the way in which a relation is sorted affects the cost of future joins. In other words, I do not want just the best order, uh, best plan for 
a given a set of relations, I may want to get the best plan for each of several useful sort orders. So, if I have a join, I may say give me the best plan sorted on the join attribute. If I am using a hash join, I may say just give me the best plan, I do not care what is the sort order. So, that procedure can be modified to take an extra parameter which is the sort order and still dynamic programming applies, all the good stuff applies and we can modify it to uh, take this sort orders into account and then get the best plan. And you can either do the top down version which we saw or the bottom up one which system are used um, actually has a way of uh, pre computing what are all the sort orders which are useful later and will generate the best plans for each of those sort orders. So, both variants work, I am going to skip the details. The next uh, set of slides is on statistics for cost estimation. Uh, for lack of uh, time, I would not get into the details here, uh, you can read it up later. I will just mention a couple of things. Uh, one of the things is for estimating the size of a selection, if uh, we have several different ways. One way is if we uh, have a selection on equality and we know the equality is on a key, we know there is only going to be one result. If the selection is on something which is not a key, how do we know how many results will be there? Even for a simple selection of the form A equal to 5, how do you know how many tuples have A equal to 5? We saw an example yesterday where uh, we had a rating and the uh, database knew there are only 5 distinct values for the rating. It, it uh, computed this statistic and then when you say select ra where rating equal to 4, it estimates that 1 in 5 tuples will satisfy that. So, if it knows there are um, 100,000 tuples, it would estimate that 100,000 by 5 which is 20,000 tuples will satisfy a rating equal to 4 or rating equal to 1 for that matter. Okay? Now, this assumes uniformity. What if the ratings are not uniform? What if the rating of uh, 4 or 5 is rare, let us say movie ratings? Um, how many uh, movies have got a rating of 5? on 5, you have seen these movie ratings in newspapers and or websites. When was the last time you saw a movie with a rating of 5? It is very rare, critics never like to give 5. They do give 4, but 4 is rare, 3 is more common, 2 is common, 1 may be less common, 0 nobody gives a 0 typically, if you, uh, well uh, let us say 0 is not an option. So, there is a non-uniformity. Now, if I have a histogram which gives the frequency of different values, given a particular selection, if I say uh, rating equal to 5, I can get a good estimate that it is a very small number, whereas rating equal to 2 or 3 will be a much larger number. So, that is where a histogram comes in useful. It helps us to avoid the uniformity assumption. Okay. There are different kinds of histograms, for lack of time I would not get into those. And then there are a bunch of slides which talk of how to do selection size estimation uh, for simple selections, complex selections, join size estimations. Um, and uh, I will just spend a minute here on join size estimation. The most common kind of join is a foreign key join. And here size estimation is easy. What is the size? If I join a relation with another and the join attribute is a foreign key from one referencing the other. I know it will be exactly the size of this relation. So, that is very easy. But what if there are selections on this? What if there is a selection on the referenced relation? What is the selection on the referencing relation? Okay, then it becomes a little more complex. We can still use the uh, you know information about foreign keys and get a better estimate. Um, but if it is not a foreign key, if it is a join on some pair of attributes, which is not a foreign key referencing in either direction, then how do you know what is the size of the join? Turns out again, if you know the number of distinct values, you can get a good estimate. So, let us uh, look at these two estimates. Now, we assume that the join is on an attribute A, that is a common attribute, we are taking a natural join. Now, V of A comma S is an estimate of how many uh, distinct values there are for attribute A in relation S. Now, what is this estimate? How do we get this estimate? For each tuple in R, 
how many tuples on average is it going to match in S? And the answer is if S had uh, 100,000 tuples and there are only 5 distinct values, each of those values is going to occur 20,000 times. And if you did a join on rating with some other relation, then each tuple in this relation we will estimate matches 100,000 by 5 which is 20,000 tuples. That is a reasonable estimate. But you may also, you will notice that this is entirely symmetric. Why should I uh, use only the estimate for S? I may symmetrically I can say I take a tuple of S and see how many tuples of R it matches. And that estimate will be NR divided by the number of distinct values of A in R. That is this estimate. So, I have two estimates for the same thing and uh, it has been shown that the lower one of these is more likely to be the uh, correct value. So, that is how you do joint size estimation in general. Again, you can do better if you have histograms on both sides and so forth. We are going to skip the details and there are more details in the book for uh, estimation for other operations. It is not just the size estimation, it is also the estimation of how many distinct values there are. Why do we need this? As we just saw, to estimate the size of a join, we need to know how many distinct values there are on the join attributes. Supposing I have a join which looks like this, R1, R2, maybe R3, to estimate the cost of or the size of this join, I need to know how many distinct values there are, let us say this is on attribute A. So, I need to know how many distinct values there are for attribute A in this join result. So, I need to uh, figure out how to estimate that also. I cannot compute any of these exactly. They have to be estimates, statistical, because I cannot run the query to find it. I am looking at a huge number of plans. So, I have to quickly estimate these numbers. Um, so, uh, the uh, book has uh, details on how to estimate the number of distinct values of a join result, of a uh, you know selection result and so forth. So, we will uh, wrap up, um, you know, join optimization and cost based optimization in, in general with that. If there are any questions, uh, you can ask me. How to decide hmm. that equivalence rule? How to decide what is a equivalence rule? Which type of equivalence rule is suitable to estimate the best plan? Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, we can take each operation or combination of operations, many of the equivalence rules. There are lot of rules. Yeah, there are a lot of rules. So, your question is uh, which rule do we use? Uh, the answer is uh, that is a some set of minimal rules uh, which uh, optimizer like SQL Server, it would use those rules always. Now, what are those rules? The rules we have given are essentially they are almost minimal. There are a few redundant rules there. We have not given a very large number. We have given about um, how many a dozen rules that is not considered very large that is a small set of rules. In fact, we have not given many rules we have, there are a lot more rules which apply to aggregation operations which we have not given. Um, so, uh, if the query does not have aggregation that rule is not useful. So, it will be eliminated 21 be used. If the query has aggregation that rule may be included and then the optimizer would find will use some set of rules. And like I said there are more complex rules which apply very rarely. Those will be used only if the basic set of rules does not produce a good plan. Are these rules common to all the data? No, uh, each database uh, fixes. First of all, uh, there are only two commercial, two, uh, yeah, two commercial optimizers which use uh, transformation rules. One is um, SQL Server, the other is uh, some version of Sybase. Uh, there are some research uh, prototypes also. There is one which was built in IIT Bombay, uh, which is actually available in public domain that also uses uh, that. And Volcano was the original one which started off the whole thing. Uh, that is a very old code base, but I think it is still available. Uh, so, each uses its own set of rules. 
but all the rest do only join order optimization and then they use some heuristics or some of these transformation rules used as heuristics. What do I mean by that? A transformation rule does not say if this is equivalent to that you must use that expression. So, you can use either one. Consider both alternatives and find the best plan. The same rule can be used as a heuristic which says if it matches the left hand side always rewrite to the right hand side. So, if the optimizer implementer decides that almost always the right hand side is going to be cheaper than the left hand side, then you can use the same rule as a uh, transformation rule heuristically. And many optimizers use such heuristic rules. They do join order optimization to consider all the join orders, but to handle other operators they use some of these rules as heuristics. Any other questions? That is actually an excellent question. Uh, so, the, uh, for the benefit of the recording, the uh, join order optimization is known to be an NP uh, complete problem um, and that is why those algorithms we saw are all exponential. Uh, so, are there ex uh, good approximation algorithms for this? This question was actually an open question for a very long time till uh, some years, I, how long, about 5, 6 years back. Uh, Professor Sumit Ganguly of IIT Kanpur uh, had a paper which showed that you cannot even approximate it. It is actually a very hard problem. Okay, so, that was actually a very nice result um, and, and that is from here, uh, from IIT Kanpur. Uh, so, uh, what we, what is used in practice industry are heuristics. So, there is no guarantee, they are heuristics. Uh, th there are, uh, like I said, if the number of relations becomes too large, you use heuristics to cut down the cost. So, some of them are polynomial heuristics. Uh, some other heuristics are not polynomial, but they will at least reduce the exponential from 2 power 100 to maybe 2 power 20 or something like that, a more manageable number. Any other questions? So, uh, I assume everyone knows what is an approximation. So, approximation is you get a plan whose cost is within some factor of the optimal. Basically, you cannot even get to in within any constant factor of the optimal always. That is what it means that to say it cannot, it, the problem cannot be approximated in polynomial time. Okay. So, join order optimization is and uh, transformations are one part. Uh, it turns out that SQL as a language has some features which cannot actually be handled directly in the simple relation algebra we have seen. In particular, nested subqueries cause a problem because they cannot be represented directly in relation algebra. So, the question is how do you optimize nested queries uh, and there are two answers to this which are used in practice. The first answer is to um, you know um, extend relation algebra a little bit to handle nested queries, but do not extend the optimizer correspondingly. Instead, we can rewrite the SQL query to remove nested subqueries wherever possible. So, this is a heuristic which most databases have some form of it. Now, how good is this depends on the database. So, for example, in PostgreSQL, um, I would request you to try this out uh, if you can. I will add it to the set of exercises. We can give a nested subquery and find the execution plan for it. If you give a simple nested subquery, PostgreSQL might actually transform it to a join, but if you or, or a semi join. But if you give a more complex nested subquery, PostgreSQL will not be able to do anything and it will actually run the outer subquery and for apply the other join conditions and then for, uh, so let me show an example of what I mean by this. We have a nested subquery which says select name from instructor where exists select star from teachers where instructor dot id the outer one equal to teachers dot id and teachers dot year equal to 2000. So, what this does is a simple nested subquery which has a correlation variable. It is using instructor from outside, it is using it in the inner query where clause. It is actually a simple query. It just finds instructors who have uh, taught some course in 2007. And if you give this query to a human, you know, we, all of us know that we can 
alternatively do this using a join and as that subquery is not really required. We could uh, have a instructor join teachers where teachers dot year equal to 2000. There is a slight difference if I do just instructor join teachers I will get duplicates. So, if I want the correct duplicate count there is a little more uh, uh, you know work has to be done. Let us ignore that for the moment um, it can be done, but the bottom line is how does the optimizer transform a nested subquery like this to a join and the answer is there are again equivalence rules effectively um, which can be applied to transform this into a join. And the intuition is that joins are likely to be much more efficient than a nested subquery. Why? Because a nested subquery as is will be evaluated once per outer tuple. If the instructor relation has a large number of tuples, the inner query is executed many times. Each execution of the inner query may do some random IO. So, overall you may get a huge amount of random IO which will make it very slow. In contrast, if you could transform it to a join of instructor and teachers, uh, maybe uh, we could use a merge join and do this very efficiently with very little random IO. So, uh, it is a good heuristic to transform nested subqueries to joins wherever possible and uh, to avoid what is called correlated evaluation. The default in SQL is correlated evaluation. We can uh, actually write this in relational algebra as follows. What we have is a selection on instructor where the selection condition theta is really this involves a subquery itself and that subquery is basically this nested. So, this one corresponds to um, it has a select instructor and the condition is exists select teachers and the condition here is uh, the year equal to 2000 and teachers dot id equal to instructor dot id. So, what that means is instructor dot id is being passed down here to this selection. So, this is not a traditional relational algebra, it is an extended relational algebra, um, but that is what is used to evaluate SQL. So, uh, this is correlated evaluation if you run it exactly as is. Hmm? Yeah, there is a dependency. So, what it is doing is it uh, takes this result, uh, result of whatever sub expression here in general. For each tuple here, it invokes this side and evaluates this whole sub expression once, passing in any parameter. In this case, um, you know the theta here is instructor dot id equals teachers dot id and year equals 2007 that is that is the condition evaluated there. So, it is actually invoking a sub uh, a relational algebra expression many times one per outer expression. No, it cannot be cyclic. Um, because the subquery is in the where clause here. So, the dependency is always uh, the variables from the uh, outer query can be used in the inner query, it, the dependency cannot be cyclic. Okay. So, now how do you do this uh, rewriting from uh, nested subquery to join? I would not get into details, but there is a small uh, example of rewriting which actually preserves the number of duplicates correctly. Um, so, what does this do? First of all, it uh, creates a temporary table from teachers where year equal to 2007 and selects distinct id. So, each instructor is stored only once even if they taught many courses and then that is joined back with instructor. This temporary table T1 is joined back with instructor on T1 dot id equal to instructor dot id. And this will ensure only instructors who have taught a course in 2007 come out. It ensures there are no duplicates simply because um, T1 does not have any duplicates. Okay. Now, you could uh, instead of doing a create table, you could have used a with clause which is equivalent, uh, but 
that is essentially what the actual decorrelation, this is called decorrelation and uh, there are a number of uh, transformation rules for decorrelation which we will not get into at this point. Uh, and to wrap up query optimization, uh, let me mention uh, the idea of uh, materialized views. Um, we have discussed this earlier I think, materialized view is a view whose results are actually computed and stored as opposed to a normal view where the results are never stored. They are computed as required and thrown away. In fact, they are not even computed fully. The with a normal view if I have a query which uses a view, it replaces the view by its definition and then it optimizes the query. So, the actual view may never get computed. The optimized query may move some relations here and there. So, the view definition now gets moved around and it is never actually computed. In contrast, the materialized view has been computed and stored. So, what are the issues here? Um, why would you do this first of all? The most common use for materialized views is to uh, pre-compute aggregates. So, supposing I have an analyst who wants to know what are the sales of a particular product uh, in a particular region uh, in each month of each year. That is one kind of aggregate query. Now, if the sales relation is very large, if you take any large retailer, big bazaar, um, you know, any of the large electronic shops, these guys have huge volumes of sales. Each of them would be selling millions of items a day, especially something like big bazaar. Now, if you run an aggregate query on hundreds of millions of items, it is going to take a long time to run. So, if the analyst gives a query and then has to wait for an hour or two to get the result, it is not a very efficient use of the analyst's time. So, what you would like is to pre-compute all this before the analyst even looks at it and then the analyst can just retrieve the pre-computed result and that is where materialized views are most useful. So, you will create materialized aggregate views um, which are maintained. So, every day new uh, sales results come in and the view is updated. Okay. So, that is a typical use. So, the question is how to uh, incrementally update the result of a view as new records come in. Um, again, we do not have time for the details, but the book has some details on how to do this for individual operations. If I have a group by operation, how to incrementally maintain it. When new tuples come, how do I update the result of the group by? When I have a join and new tuples come, how do I update it? But it is not only new tuples, I may also delete tuples. So, delete tuples, how do I update it? I may even update a tuple, in which case, how do I change the materialized view? All of this has to be taken into account and uh, the book again has details on how to do this for individual operations as well as for an entire query because a materialized view is a query with multiple operations. So, if any underlying relation changes, I have to uh, compute the change to the view result and update it. So, how to do this is described in the book. I am going to skip uh, details here. And uh, the final thing was a question which uh, somebody asked uh, yesterday, uh, which is given that we have indices and if you have materialized views, the problem is correspondingly more complex. What indices and what materialized views should I create? And the answer is it depends on the workload and how do you get the workload? Many databases, in fact, pretty much all databases let you turn on a parameter which logs all the queries which are executed. So, you get a log of all the queries which ran over some period of time. You can use this to determine uh, which uh, indices to create, which materialized views to create. You can do it manually, that is very hard actually or you can use a tool which is provided by most of the commercial databases called an index tuning wizard or uh, um, database tuning wizard or you know, they have different names for this whatever the tool is called, it is all major databases have it. PostgreSQL does not, it is not commercial, but the commercial ones have it. You can use that tool to help you make this choice. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Uh, there are some other optimization techniques which are there in the book. I will skip the details um, and that wraps up our uh, session on query optimization. And it also leaves us about two and a half hours for transaction processing.
So obviously, I will be going fast over that. Um, are there any questions before I switch to transaction processing? Okay. I think I mentioned this briefly yesterday. Uh, so um, that's some. Uh, so if you get a set of queries, how do you optimize them collectively? And it turns out this dynamic programming algorithm, which we said that the best plan for something is based on finding the best plan for the subsets. It turns out when you have a set of queries, this does not quite work. So, dynamic programming is based on uh, what is called the principle of optimality that the best plan for something is composed of the best plans for its subparts. The problem with multi query optimization is that you may have a plan which is sub plan which is not optimal but it is actually shared by many different queries. So, it makes sense to use that for this query rather than the optimal plan for this query. That actually has a lot of repercussions. It makes the problem of optimization a lot more difficult. So, the dynamic programming actually has to change significantly because of this and it becomes very expensive which is not practical. Therefore, we need some heuristics uh, which are reasonably efficient and work well in practice. And implementing those heuristics itself turns out to be non-trivial. Um, so, it requires some uh, bunch of clever tricks to make them work efficiently, even the heuristics. Um, so, uh, that problem has been addressed including some work from here, where we looked at um, how do you, what, what heuristics make sense and how do you implement the heuristics efficiently, which itself turned out to be non-trivial. Um, so, we, we did some work about 10 years back on that. And uh, multi query optimization has turned out to be quite useful in many domains. So, I, I do not know if anyone is using exactly that implementation, but um, it, it, it is being used in some contexts. Yeah. If you look at the commercial, if you look at the commercial applications nowadays, hmm. which are using huge databases, uh, then you will see that okay, it is about dynamics of the data rather than going and writing to the databases after some time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the relational model is Thanks. That is very nice. Talking about the optimization and query processing and all Yeah. That is a, a nice question uh, which is uh, forcing me to talk about something which I did not really cover in uh, these things. So, the question is uh, that a lot of applications today require data analysis as opposed to uh, updating of data. So, in fact, in general, uh, the database uh, application world is split into two parts. One is called OLTP for online transaction processing. And the other is called decision support system of which one aspect is OLAP which stands for online analytical processing. There are other aspects to decision support also. So, OLAP is something which uh, I briefly alluded to just a little while back where I said an analyst needs answers quickly for aggregate queries. And how do you support that? Basically, OLAP systems are designed to pre-compute a number of aggregates so that whatever question the analyst asks, either the answer is already computed or it can be efficiently computed from one of the already computed answers. So, that you never have to go back to the underlying relation. Which the online part is basically because the answers can be given online as opposed to telling the analyst, ok, I have accepted the query, come back tomorrow, I will give you the answer. Then it is not online query. Um, so, coming back to the specific question, it was uh, should you use traditional uh, designs for relational databases? for the problem of decision support. And the answer to this question is there are certain decision support queries where the traditional databases are fine, but uh, there is also other representations. The relational model is not changed, but the implementation underlying implementation is changed. There is something called column stores, which have 
been shown to be quite useful for uh, many decision support applications, not all, but many. And what is the column store? If you take a traditional database, as we saw, we have a notion of pages or blocks and then there are records inside it and all the attributes of a record are together. Now, what many people realized is that for some of these decision support queries, you have records with many fields, many of which are not used for many queries. Uh, most of the queries access only one or two fields. Now, if you have to read a page with all the other fields, it becomes quite slow. So, they said let us push this representation to a column representation, which essentially looks like this. Okay. So, you store a file which has um, say attribute. So, let us say this is R of A B C is a relation. So, what they do is they store in a file attribute A of all the tuples. They store in another file attribute B of all tuples and in a third file attribute C of all tuples. Now, what have we done? Instead of storing records, normally we have cut them vertically and stored you know for a particular column we are storing the values for all records together. So, we have reclustered the things instead of row major we have done column major representation. Now, why is this useful? If I do not want to access B and C I only want to access A I can access one file which is one third or maybe even much smaller than the whole thing. The second thing which uh, trick which is used is that once I have all these values which are from the same domain, I can use compression much more effectively because they are all from the same domain. So, a file which would have uh, been in raw form which would have been uh, 100 megabytes. Now, all of those are integers which are age. Now, we can optimize this, we can compress it very effectively to be instead of 100 megabytes, it may come down to 5 megabytes. Now, some of these are compression techniques might have applied even in the traditional row representation, but they are not as effective because there are many different kinds of uh, attributes stored together. So, the compression is not as effective. So, by combination of avoiding reading things and compression for many queries, a column store can be much faster, you know, even 5 to 10 times faster than a relational uh, the row oriented representation. So, people have responded in different ways. Some people have gone and built an entire database using only the column store representation. Others have taken the traditional database and added indices which are really column stores. So, they continue to keep the rows, but they have an extra column store which is like a materialized view or an index on the original relation. It is an index really. And yet others have uh, looked at alternatives which combine uh, you know within a block they will store tuples column wise. But all the tuples uh, all the attributes for a particular set of tuples will be together on one block. So, it is a not exactly column major, it is not row major, it is more like a zigzag order. So, different variations have been uh, tried out in practice and implemented in different systems. I hope that answered your question unless you had something else. Unstructured data. understand this question is. Uh, so, we have this relational model which has a very strong structure, we do detailed schema design, but there are many applications where the structure is not as firm and people want a flexible structure. So, today uh, you know you let us take users. Um, so, any company like Google keeps user profiles. Now, what are the attributes of that user profile? So, there are some common attributes uh, you know login name, name, age uh, or date of birth, whatever uh, location, a few things which are going to be common for all users. Now, there are users of different uh, what are called properties or uh, parts of the Google empire or the Yahoo empire. 
So, each of those may want some extra attributes to be stored about that user, like what are the set of friends of this user is something which one component wants to store, another guy may want to store something else. So, the net result is the set of attributes may change dynamically and it is different for different users. So, these are called um, flexible schemas. So, now there has been work on uh, two fronts, one is uh, for example, SQL server itself internally um, at least in the prototype, I do not know if it has been released yet in uh, 2008 version, I, mean, I think it may be there in the next version. It has uh, support for relations where you can add at, uh, attributes as you please, it can have thousands of attributes and yet it will be stored efficiently, you can dynamically add attributes, it will not cause any problems. So, that is an example of a flexible schema and of course, uh, non-relational databases like the data stores used in Google, Yahoo and pretty much everybody else all support flexible schemas which let you add attributes on the fly. In fact, um, some of these uh, use what is called the JSON, if you are familiar with JavaScript, uh, JavaScript has a notion of objects. But unlike traditional objects, JavaScript objects can have as many attributes as you want. They're, JavaScript is naturally a flexible schema language, okay. And it has a storage representation called JavaScript object notation, which is a storage representation for JavaScript objects, which have flexible schema. So, this is becoming quite popular, many of these databases now let you directly store objects in JavaScript object notation and retrieve them. So, when you store it from JavaScript and retrieve from JavaScript, it is actually very efficient. Uh, of course, if you do it from PHP, there are converters which will take a PHP object and convert it automatically to a JavaScript object and let you stick it into one of these stores and conversely retrieve it and get it out as a PHP object. Any questions? Any more? Thanks. I think there have been a good set of questions.